Ladies and gents, if you are familiar with using poker solvers, then you will know that in many, many situations, the solver tells us that the EV of our options is exactly the same. Betting this size is the same as betting this size. Raising is the same as calling. Folding is the same as calling off your stack to 2x pot. What are the chances that that's true in the real world? Well, consider the following analogy. What are the chances that the number of spoons in my house are the same as the number of spoons in your house? That's right. Very, very low. It's possible there will be some pairs of two people who do have the same number of spoons in their households, but there's going to be a lot of variation as well. Does that mean that I have no idea who has the most spoons out of you and me? You might think I have no clue, that I'd just be guessing, but actually, I think it's highly likely that my household contains more spoons than yours. The reason for this is that my household contains four cats and two dogs and two humans, and every morning we use separate animal spoons to dish up the animal food, and every evening they get fed twice a day, and we don't eat with those same spoons, because that's kind of gross, right? Cat food's really stinky. I don't know if you've ever had a cat, but the food doesn't smell that good. Dog food's not much better. So we end up in this situation where I am able to predict that something like eight or nine times out of ten, my household has more spoons than the average viewer. So if we surveyed a hundred of you, most of you have less spoons than me, and that's not a brag, it's not a flex. I'm not like, man, I've got so many fucking spoons. I'm so powerful. That's not what I'm doing. But you get the point. In poker, although in theory, just like in theory with spoons, the average two people have a similar number of spoons, right? That's kind of a given. In poker, in theory, the average line has the same EV in many spots, not all spots, as some other line or other lines. But in reality, the EVs are different. And your job is to play like a human. You can train like a solver, but you must play like a human and you must attempt to figure out which line is better. And see, when you start doing that, rather than just recalling GTO and copying outputs you've seen, poker gets a hell of a lot more fun and a hell of a lot more interesting. Before we get into the session footage here and start reviewing, just want to remind you guys that my good friend, Carrot Corner coach James Shea, professional poker player, 500 NL player, is running his Fortress seminars on the 15th of November for six weeks. You can join by signing up on carrotcorner.com. Just click the top link in the description. Now let's get to this video and let's see who's got more spoons. I think it's going to be me. So in this first spot, we open pocket fives under the gun and we are cold called by the button, an unknown player here. I'd assume that most people who cold call here are recreationals, some regs do, but many don't. And so the chances of being against a recreational player here have increased significantly. On the flop, we decide just a bit small. I think we're going to do this with lots of a range. It's a fine play with this hand. Not much to say about it. And we face this action. So right off the bat here, this is a situation, you can see my mouse kind of darting about the screen as I try and figure out what's best. That is essentially me comparing who has the most spoons between the line of calling and three betting. In equilibrium, in game theory, these invincible hands tend to slow play as the SBR comes down, like as villain starts bloating the pot in relation to the effective stack size. There's going to be a hell of a lot of call here. This might be a pure call, like a pure slow play in GTO. But in GTO, the raising range is going to be really good ace x plus and bluffs. Some flush draws maybe, but also some other bluffs. And what's going to happen in GTO is that when we call and check the turn, villain is going to go for enough value with their good ace x. They're not going to start checking terribly often. And they're also going to bluff and triple barrel and stuff like that at high frequency. We're probably just meant to like call all the way down with this hand. And that makes a ton of sense, so I'm sure that call is probably the main play here in theory, if not the only play. But after flickering my mouse cursor around the screen a bit more, I decided that recreational players, which I'm now sure this is, it's a really giant flop raise in position, there's a cold call pre. The chances of this being a reg now, while it's still possible, are astronomically small, astronomically unlikely. And so I decided to do this. And the reason I do this is I think that this is an equity-driven flop raising range. Equity-driven is one of these jargony terms you'll hear experienced players talk about. And what it means is that the range doesn't have many low EV bluffs. It doesn't have many hands with terrible equity. In theory, if you're building this raising range, you're supposed to have some bluffs that aren't flush draws. You're meant to have some hands like Jack-10 of clubs or something like that, or 7-6 of clubs. I don't think this is happening, like hardly ever especially for this sizing. This is going to be equity driven. It's going to be a flush draw. It's going to be an ace. It doesn't even have to be a good ace. The other thing that you should know about how recreational players build a flop raising range is that they merge it and they tend to base it a lot on absolute hand strength. So if Villain does have a hand like ace seven suited here, 
I fully expect it to raise at some frequency and expect this range to be overloaded with random ASX combos. And what that means is that if I call and try to maximize my EV against the compartment of hands that has low EV that I'd be blowing out of the pot by 3-betting, that just doesn't make sense because those hands are now underrepresented in villain's true range. So I know how many spoons this guy has. So let's not pretend I don't. Why would I play against the average amount of spoons, or the theoretically correct amount of spoons, which is obviously 9.3 to have in your house, by the way, when I know that this player has way more a6 spoons? This analogy is becoming chaotic now, but you get the point. So we decide to 3-bet here, which I really like. The turn is the deuce of spades. Not ideal, because now a6 is still the most dominant thing, and perhaps now it has a reason not to pay me off. But I thought I would rope a dope. I thought I would bet small here. Jam doesn't seem like it's a thing, theoretically, anyway, for good reason at this SPR. There's really no reason to put more money in the pot than this. Just went for quarter pot here, setting up an SPR of like 0.5 or something on the river, there or thereabouts. So that's going to be nice and easy to just lure a villain in. The thing is, the villain does have an ace here. They have some redraw against flushes and stuff, and even against our hands sometimes with boat outs and things. So we're going to get called here by an ace almost always. We're going to get called down by a flush almost always. The river... Obviously we jam, we don't let the merge range check back, nothing fancy here. We're probably going to get some folds now from like ace 8, ace 9, ace 10 at some frequency, but you have to try. Villain does tank for a long time here. And eventually folds. And we didn't even click the money bags emote there because we were too disappointed not to win the full stack. But very often we will be winning the full stack in that spot. And I think flop is a clear 3 bet against the true range of our opponent and it's a great example of using reads to actually improve upon the EV that the solver tells you you get by taking its main line which will be called. Here's another fun spot, blind versus blind, 9-6, good old 96 of hearts, we flick in the call here. Ace jack 4, going to be playing big bet only against the check here, just building around our value region which is the ace plus, we're not going to bet jack 10 or 6s in this spot so we're going to just build around that. You can bet 9-6 a heart, sure. You should probably check it slightly more than you bet it. In theory, I would guess, but who cares? I don't have a strong feel, by the way, about what's better on this node. I think both lines are just legitimately really close. Like, I can't actually tell which line has the most spoons. But then, when Villain checks again here, I decide to do this. And this is a bit weird, because when you look at this in theory, you're probably thinking, the preflop caller doesn't have that many nutty hands on this node. But the thing is, we do still have two pair in King-10 pretty frequently. Villain's range here, I think, is going to be far weaker than in GTO when it comes to the nut combos. I think the nutted combos are going to struggle immensely to check twice. And it's not that they're meant to check twice that often in theory, but they're meant to check twice sometimes. Ask yourself, how often does a human that you play against have King-10 here? Or pocket queens? Or pocket jacks? Or even queen jack or ace queen or ace jack or ace four? I think the answer is almost never. So if their range is mostly queen x, jack x, pocket 7s, pocket 8s, pocket 10s, this is going to be a really, really good play. This will be a marvelous play, exploitatively speaking, because the fold equity you're going to yield with a bet size like this is just going to be astronomically high. The MDF here, minimum defense frequency, which we're not big fans of at Carrot Corner, I explain why that concept can get abused and used incorrectly in the Carrot Poker School in quite a few different places. But the MDF in this situation is going to be about 40%. We're risking 9 to win 6, 9 to get back 60% of 15. So Villain is going to have to defend 40% of the time in this situation, folding 60%. And that's really hard. It's really, really difficult. Very difficult. Like, impossible. For a human, it's just damn right, like, silly to even think that that could be happening. To think this bet gets through less than 60% of the time here is definitely... Not true. I think this bet gets through 75% of the time. Something like that. So this is just a short example of building a sizing into your strategy that is probably not the solver's main choice. It's probably not even a thing. Most likely the solver just bets 75% pot here when it opens the action and checks a lot. But I just decided this is fine. This is the best play. This is good. There's not going to be enough King-10. I don't care what my strategy is supposed to be. I don't give a shit. Although, it's not too absurd for us to overbet here actually because we could have King-10. And we have King-10 off flatting pre and stuff like that. Full frequency, so... It's not even that insane in theory. But yeah, cool deviation. Let's see if it works. I know you guys love results. And I know that you hate me, like just generally that you hate me, but you hate me even more when I don't show you results. That gives you a really easy ammunition, some really easy ammo to just go after me. We would have made the flush look at rabbit hunted. Good fold by villain, therefore. Okay, a blind versus blind situation. We open small blind. Villain calls in the big blind. Didn't know this player. Possibly recreational. 
we decide to check the flop this time bet and check are both fine of course and again they'll run pretty close if you made me guess though against a recreational player i would favor check because i think this bet just gets made at a stupidly high frequency i'll show you what i mean when we go to showdown here like a key example of this with the part of villains range that they actually had because this hand is going to showdown don't turn your televisions off it's going to showdown you're going to see you're watching this on television right that's what that's what's happening you you know casting it onto your tv good you should be i want to be full screen in your living room in front of your family i want them to know who i am i want to be famous i want to be on the real television not just your youtube screens on your phones get it sorted guys get it casted anyway king nine decided to raise here the reason being villain has bet the flop with far more 4x 6s 5s 7s 8s 9x 3x and ace high and draws in a solver has. Again, this is too merged, it's too equity driven in real life, meaning too full of those medium to good hands and medium to good draws. There will be some absolute shit in here as well. I don't really trust people to aggress frequently enough if I check call here. Like, I'm not sure that on many runouts people are just going to take their, let's say, jack eight and just bomb. Like, it'll happen sometimes, but I think when you think your opponent's likely recreational and has too merged of a range, you certainly want to go ahead and raise here. Note also that Villain has no capitals in their name. Only recreational players are so self-degrading not to put capitals in their name. Look at Louisa here. Look at Foldmasters, all regs. Jack 8, clearly a reg. Suave guy in a cowboy hat. Us, capitals for both of our names. You know, this is how you tell a reg from a recreational player, guys, among other things. So we go for raise because that's what we want to do against these merge ranges. Fully planning on blasting off really clean runouts. It's not going to be often that we get a runout we can go bomb, bomb, bomb on. And this is definitely a card that merges the opponent's range a little bit more. Like he's now going to have some 5-6, some ace-5, some 2-pair, some deuces. You know, it's just going to be a few more combos of nutty stuff. Now, I think you can still go a bit bigger than this on the turn. I went for third pot there, which I definitely want to bet the turn, by the way. I don't want to check the turn because you've got this merged condensed range now. Another thing that fish are going to do here is 3-bet the flop with their sets like at a really, really high frequency. A much higher frequency than in theory. That means that this range is still mergy. You could probably get away with like half pot on the turn. Sometimes I get stuck in this like unhealthy mold of being like, well, their current poker skill sizes are B33, B75, and B150, so I can only choose one of those. And um, that's Dean, by the way, from a, a few videos ago. I made up a character. Some people liked it. Some people were like, Pete, don't do that again. It's too cringe. I couldn't watch it. Man, if you find that cringe, I feel like you're the kind of person that just gets embarrassed really easily and probably just doesn't live a very fun life because you're always afraid of, you know, being ashamed of shit. But anyway, I digress. Go back and check out that video if you want to see me act out some silly voices. But yeah, I got stuck in that thought process on the turn here. On the river, I think this is a clear check now. There's nothing else to really say. The good news is that most humans that are, you know, mortal poker players and not end bosses aren't going to turn enough pairs into bluffs here, which is good news for us. But yeah, the 9-6, the reason I want to show you the showdown is that one, you won't hate me as much. You'll still hate me, but not as much if I show you. And secondly, on the flop here, this hand is supposed to check like pretty frequently against the check, right? This check back range is meant to protect itself with plenty of the top pair combos that can bet once or twice, but not three times that like a lot of turn cards like 9-6 does with the backdoor straight that don't have the backdoor flush potential and don't want as big a pot on average. Therefore, this is a hand that's going to do a lot of checking behind. It's not a bad bet, but it's going to do a lot of checking behind, but people are going to bet it at too high a frequency. And when people are putting second best hand in their betting range at too high a frequency against your hand, you want to raise the hell out of them. So that's the exploit there. We played this hand against the reg. I think this was a reg anyway. We squeezed ace four here. This hand went disastrously, by the way, for us. Spoiler alert. We got a little bit out of line here, maybe, but I'll, I'll explain my logic. I have some reasoning for this play. We squeeze and check the flop here. Very easy check call. I don't think this hand wants to check raise this SBR, nor does it want to fold. We want to do a lot of checking on 437 rainbow. Four straight turn is absolutely horrible for us, but we do have a set blocker here. And against really small sizing, given that we have a lot of ace, king, ace, queen, etc. in our range, I think that we probably have to continue this again against this size. Now, this is obviously a more GTO thought process, but my thoughts here were if this is a reg, when it comes down to the river, I don't think they're going to jam thinly enough for value here. Like, I really don't think they're going to jam King Jack in this spot. I think they're going to check it back way too often. Maybe they should jam King Jack. Maybe it's a situation where I meant to have raised too many of my overpairs on the flop. I don't think so. Maybe King Jack's a check back. But in either case, it's closer than people think. So people are checking back here with Ace Jack, King Jack, Queen Jack, that kind of thing. Obviously, I take my time here. If you snap, do anything in this spot, like, it's really bad. 
I decided that the ace-queen, king-queen combos, stuff like this, king-10, queen-10 suited, 10-9 suited, 8-9, this is the bluff region. And I just figured the value region is not very wide and I have the blocker to the set. So Villain has 6 combos of 6s, 3 combos of 7s, and probably 3 combos of 5s, which is like 12 value combos. Maybe there's like 7-6 suited for another 3 combos. 15 value combos is 5-4. Maybe there are more value combos than I thought. Shit, that's quite a lot of value combos. So for SBR1, Villa needs to be 2 to 1 value to bluffs, which means that if they do have like 15 value combinations here, let's say, then they need to have about 7.5 bluff combinations for me to call. But, and that's maybe not that easy, because they actually have to get here now with like King-Queen suited and always go for it on both streets. Some of that's going to be spades and giving up. King-10 suited. Same thing, Queen 10. There just aren't that many bluff combos here, actually. Maybe there's just too many value combos here, even when I have the four. Like, it's a really relevant blocker. And in theory, I do think that this is probably a call, or at least the mixed call, because, like, what better bluff catcher do I have here? Ace King is not better, because I don't have the four blocker. Yeah, I don't even think that, like, Queens is a better bluff catcher. Queens seems way worse as a call than Ace 4 here. King seems way worse as a call than Ace 4 here. So maybe I got a little bit stuck in like the whole, well, I have to call because that's the best blocker hand or something to that effect. Yeah, I guess Theory's going to call, but exploitatively, I think it's much, much easier to underbluff here than overbluff actually by this river. So I'm going to go ahead and say that I should have folded here. I should have made a deviation. I did run into the fives and I got a little bit too seduced by my blockers in this spot. And that's an example as well of why in these situations where it's just like a really big pot that's undergone a lot of range filtering, like loads of different stuff has already happened. You just need to be aware that the reality of the situation may be completely different to the theory and likely one person has more spoons than the other, as we saw in the intro. I think I proved that to you philosophically and therefore, yeah, it's probably an exploit fold on the river, but it kind of sucks because we do want to make these hero calls with the right blockers, but it's probably a spot we shouldn't, to be honest. Okay, 7-6 of spades, reasonable hand, gonna open this on the button. And we are gonna get some action here. Obviously, it would be a very, very pointless thing to be showing you, and they both fold. Okay, on to the next hand. 10-8-5, two-tone. I'm going to play big bet or check here, just as a general thing. I don't mind a small bet, guys. Like, I'm not here today to force GTO down your throats or anything like that. Some days I'm in that mood, and I'm like, you will learn this, the theory. And other days I'm like, do what you want. And this is definitely a do what you want day. So you can play small bets on this flop as well without, like, theoretical EV loss. But then you can do anything you want in most spots without that happening. So who cares? King of Hearts turn. I think you can play big bet and over bet here. You can play like a double sizing strategy. The only reason I would maybe include big bet here as well as over bet into my toolkit is that, you know, hands like ace 10 and jacks and stuff want a big bet or a bad king. Whereas like the better kings, etc. plus want to over bet. Maybe some bad kings can over bet as well, especially if they have the flush draw. Like king X of clubs. We get to this river now, and sizing is cool in this spot, so I just figured here, right, let's find a sizing that looks pretty scary, that is going to be interpreted as an overbet, and is going to elicit some sort of, oh god, I don't know if I can call that kind of sizing from this player. I didn't know this player does have a space between the names, does look a bit reggish in terms of the VPIP. Generally, whales don't run a 14 VPIP even in this absurd GG small sample HUD thing you're looking at. I figured that this is an elasticity spot. This is a spot where getting the sizing right is really important because if you are against a recreational here or like a tight recreational or something like that or a semi-reg, probably the elasticity between going 38.8, which is the sizing I chose here. I think this is a really good river bluffing hand, by the way. It unblocks the hell out of the folding range. So I think this is a good bluff to follow through with probably all the time in theory. In practice, I think it's even better for this sizing. You know, we need just over 50% fold equity, like 52% fold equity, something like that. Man, it's going to be so hard for Villain to defend 48% of the time here. That's a lot of their range they're going to have to defend. If I had to guess what the true fold equity is here, in terms of... True EV. I haven't done that for a while. Missed it. Then I would say it's probably like 60%. That's what I would guess. I'd say this works six times out of ten, what I'm about to do here. And if that's the case, we've found a really nice sweet spot. Now, consider what would happen if I went for, like, 54. Well, now it has to work, like, 61% of the time or 62% or something like that. Don't quote me on that. Somewhere around there. And that's a harder thing to prove. And at that point, like, what's the difference between 38 and 54? Okay, there's going to be some. Like, some people are going to notice that. 
Some might even swing their entire decision based on it, but that's going to be very few. It's going to be a small minority. Most people will not bat an eyelid at the difference between that. They're just going to interpret it as, oh, big bet, I have 10-9, don't want to call. Or big bet, I have ace-10, don't want to call. It's also worth noting that we didn't bet the turn for overbet here, and that might exploitatively actually enhance our fold equity on the river node. So yeah, in real life poker, this is the kind of stuff I talk to people about in one-to-one -one coaching all the time, by the way, that I don't necessarily always talk about on YouTube, but it's so important to play like a human. Yeah, you want to train like a solver. You want to understand that your hands are really good bluff in theory here, but you want to play like a human. What really defines whether you bet 7-6 on the river isn't your own range and your balance and how often you're bluffing. Do you know how many comments I get on this channel? And this is you guys. I'm talking to you right now. Where you guys are like, oh, you're going to be over bluffing there, Pete. And I'm like, yeah. And? And you've assumed this is a bad thing? So what if I'm over bluffing here? This might be a good spot to actually bluff with ace four of clubs. If the fold equity is sufficient, even ace four of clubs, a pure check back in the solver, may be a good bluff in this spot. So just watch it, yeah? Before you start accusing people of over bluffing, like it's a bad thing. It's like, oh, you're over taking money from that pot of free money. You shouldn't take so much of that money that's been given to you for free. Okay, maybe there's ethical concerns here, but let's ignore those for now. The highest DV line when you're given a big bag of money is to take all of it, yeah? So don't leave money on the table because you're worried about the proportion of bluffs to value in your range in this opaque situation that is real life poker where nobody fucking knows the balance of your range or what's going on or anything like that. So you're going to have to realize at some point in your poker career, you know, that emulating solver play and trying to be balanced with respect to value to bluff ratios is not actually where money comes from. There was a great Phil Galfon quote at the start of like his PLO course where he said something like, I don't believe that EV comes from the same place that a lot of other people believe it comes from, which is like trying to get really close to GTO. And I just thought that was like a really good way to start a course because any good poker course that's about maximizing real life EV against humans needs to talk about the fact that you're not indifferent in all of these spots. So here, there is a big difference in the EV between me betting 38 and me betting 58, but the solver won't reflect that. It'll say they're the same. Okay, last hand for the day. Another clue here. 3x open from our opponent, indicative that they are not a regular. This is a really rare reg sizing. By the way, guys, it doesn't matter how good or bad it is to do that. That's not the point. So if you want to say, oh, well, you know, that's a fine sizing, actually. So it could be a reg. That doesn't follow because empirically not many regs actually do that. And that's more important. Just because it would be a good idea, let's say, for a dog to study mathematics at high level and go to Harvard, that doesn't mean that dogs are doing that. So you can't say, well, it would be good for a dog to do that, actually. So it might be a dog that's studying math at Harvard. That's how absurd it is to say, well, 3x is a fine size, so it might be a reg that's doing it. That's a recreational player. It's a fish, like almost always. Okay, so go for the check here. We'll be checking tons on this flop. I think the main thing, again, to say here, it's a similar theme to earlier, is that the recreational player is going to be betting this flop at too high of a frequency overall, probably, but mostly too high a frequency with mergy hands, like not mixing some pair into the check back range often enough, or some like queen jack of clubs, I think will be betting too frequently here on average compared to what it's meant to. The hand's probably meant to check back a fair amount of the time. And so we have a theoretically indifferent spot here. I'm pretty sure that call and raise are both totally fine here with the ace of clubs. I actually think without the ace of clubs, the solver's going to play more raise at this SBR, just looking to get more useful fold equity and unblocking flush draws that you're quote-unquote getting thin value from. I think this hand will be a mix of both, but rolling here is really silly. So rolling here, and I've been guilty of this in the past, you know, someone pointed out at some point that sometimes I just fall into this mode of like rolling stuff and trying to demo what GTO looks like. This isn't actually how I would play if I was grinding professionally for a living. So I shouldn't actually do it in content without specifying that I'm just doing it for that purpose. So me trying to play my best poker and me trying to emulate theory, these are kind of two different things. And in this spot, if I was emulating theory, I would say this is a mix. I'm going to roll this frequency. Let's see how close I got. But that's not what you should be doing. In real life, you need to decide which line is better. And I think raising is way better. Yeah, okay, you're going to get stacked by 8s and 6s and 5s, but that's part and parcel for low SBR situations where you've got a good hand. Like, you're meant to get stacked. That's I don't want to use the word cooler, because I think that's a dumb term that gets overused and used badly, but it's definitely a situation where you need to be accepting that you're going to get it in dead sometimes. But you're also going to get loads of money against 8, 7, 6, 7, 7s, 9s, 10s, jacks, queens. If queens doesn't 4-bit pre, it doesn't always in the hands of a weaker player. Draws, I've seen people jam, jack 10 of clubs on you here when you raise. So I think raise is head and shoulders above call here. I think calling is a mistake. I think this is a clear raise call down. 
and there's nothing else to say. When villain jams, obviously, yeah, sometimes we take the worst of it here, but that's okay. If you're trying to play this spot in terror, if you're trying to, like, avoid being stacked at all costs, you can see I don't even think about there, I just snap. Run into Jack Snow Club. You have 90% equity. Let's run it once. Let's not cash out. No way. No thank you. 97%. Oh god. Survived it. That's always fun, right? The little peel there that GG does. And we win. Did we do a celebratory em emote that time? No. Sometimes I do gloat at the fish. People say, oh, you should be nice to the fish or they might stop playing the game. Screw that, man. I want to rub it in their face. I want them to suffer. I want them to suffer. Hope you enjoyed that, guys. For more from me, it's carrotcorner.com. Don't forget to check out the Carrot Poker School there. It's the place to get your foundations right before you start embarking on this quest of figuring out exactly what's better. I want to make one thing very, very clear on that note. It's really hard to know what's better when you don't know a baseline, when you've got no idea like how the game works objectively, what the laws of physics of the universe of poker are. It's near impossible to think in this way. But the better you get at that, and that's what the Carrot Poker School seeks to do, make you better at that, the better you get at exploiting. If you like exploitative stuff though, we have exploit courses on there as well, like Grady e of the Carrot Poker School, or for a shorter course that's a little bit more affordable, do check out Cash Injection as well. I will see you guys soon for another video. Let me know what you think about this format. I really like making it, so I'm happy to make loads more. Alright, see you soon.